everyone. I'm Susan Nash. Really happy to be here today. And we have a really great um, program today. It's, we are here because of popular demand for this topic, dealing with well, well data for now and the energy transition, historical and new, uh, referring to new data, historical data, all that wonderful legacy um, material. And we will have introductions at the beginning. Then we'll have, in a slightly different order than showing on the screen, we'll have, um, we'll start with Jess Cosman, and then we'll go to Bulu Cherian, Premier Oil Fuel Group. Jess is with uh, Catalyst Data Management. He's here from Australia. And um, Bulu is here from Houston. Nathan Ganser, Premier Oil Fuel Group, will also be speaking. Sashi Guntaru, Petrobites, it's a Houston contingent. And Brian McDowell will be speaking. And I think, are you in Houston, Brian, or are you in, in Midland? Uh, I'm in Midland. Okay, in excellent. Beautiful Midland. Nice. Okay. So what we'll do, uh, well, that's our program tonight, and we'll have some time for audience participation. Just want to let you know that we will have, um, have a recording available to you. And I want to thank our sponsor, Aramco for being a generous sponsor of this entire series and also of our APG Academy. And I also want to thank Zrathus for being a platform sponsor. And I'd like you to, to, to go ahead and, and look in the chat or put a few links to joining the APG and also Energy Opportunities, which is coming up November 12th. You'll really enjoy it. I uh, just encourage you to ch check the link while, while we're waiting. And in the meantime, I would like to go ahead and stop screen sharing and turn the podium, the Zoom screen, <laughs> over to our AAPG president, Gretchen Gillis. Thank you, Susan. Good evening, good morning. Hello, everyone. It's great to see you. Um, I'm a little disoriented because I was up at the early hours today with the uh, International Geomechanics Symposium that AAPG was involved in with the American Rock Mechanics Association. So it's been a long and busy day full of new ideas and new technology. And that's, that's kind of why we're here. And um, so I want to thank Susan for her energy and continuing to pull together these, these uh, webinars that, that are so much fun because hearing about pivoting is one of the more dynamic things that we're doing. Um, I would like to take a moment putting my AAPG hat firmly on to ask that if you're not a member, please join. If you are a member, please log into aapg.org. Please go to the member directory, make sure that you are current in your dues that your profile is up to date, that you're receiving email from AAPG, because all of this is going to put you in a position to vote on the upcoming merger proposal with SPE. And this is really one of the more uh, important decisions that the members have in the coming months and historically within AAPG. And so um, I really wanna make sure that all members who are eligible to, to vote are ready to participate in that decision because the decision belongs to the members. So I think that's all I wanna say for tonight because I'd really rather get into the pivoting. And uh, so Susan, with great thanks, I hand it back to you and I look forward to our uh, presentations and discussion. Oh, great, thank you. And I'd like to also just take a few seconds to um, have our a few of our leaders talk and we have um, we have Mike Bingle Davis, who's the president-elect for Energy Minerals Division. So Mike, would you like to say a few words? Sure, uh, you know, just to kind of echo what Gretchen was saying, make sure and register or sign up if you're not a member, fill out your, fill out your sheets and forms. I, I put the Energy Opportunities 2021 sort of uh, outline in the chat so you can get a copy of that, that's coming up. And, I just want to thank the group to put this together. I mean, this is a topic that's extremely important. Um, I don't know if anyone caught it on LinkedIn, but I have, I think, five terabytes of data. And so I just appreciate everything you guys have done. I appreciate everybody for being here. And uh, 
you know, look into the energy minerals division. It's, it's a very pertinent topic right now. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Mike. And you're in lovely Casper, Wyoming. And so I'd also like to now introduce Jillian Shannon, who's our, with our um, sustainability committee. So welcome, Jillian. Oh, and thank you again for having me, Susan. Uh, I, I do apologize for a little of the background noise. There was a few uh, car troubles on the way back from work today, uh, but I pulled over safely and I'm, I'm so glad that I'm able to join you all. Uh, I'm from the Sustainable Development Committee. And again, thank you, Susan, the speakers, and of course, the series for wonderful series of talks. Kind of building on, Mike, uh, on Mike's point there about five terabytes of data. If you haven't already, please catch the previous uh, episode that we've done uh, with, with Brian. He explained sort of the vast amounts of data that he has uh, sitting around and how he's digitizing that. So it's really exciting. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, and I'll keep it really brief. Sustainable Development Committee, communicating the broad, positive, to technical, economic, environmental benefits of the petroleum industry and its collective efforts towards sustainability. The latest thing that we have going on is we released a new podcast with uh, the Katie Menert from uh, Ally Energy. And she's talking about the importance of diversity and inclusion the energy industry and really the goal of making safe and clean energy equitable for all. So it's available on Spotify and other streaming services. So if you have the time, we'd be more than happy and very thankful that you've checked it out. Finally, there's also the CCUS conference that's coming up in March of 2022 here at the University of Houston. So we're in the powerhouse city and the abstract submission deadline is November 17th. So we look forward to seeing you there. And thank you again, Susan. We really appreciate it. Looking forward to some great talks. Oh, thank you. And I just want to mention that you will be getting a, a copy of the recording and you will be able to do uh, transcripting then. I know that we have the, the closed captioning transcripting capacity with Zoom, but every time I've used it, it's frozen Zoom. So I <laughs> don't really want that to happen. So you can always use it when you're re-watching re um, it. So thank you for your patience. So I'm really delighted to be able to introduce Jess Cosman from Australia. And he's here to talk to us about geotechnical data in the cloud and how it supports the transition to a low carbon economy with examples from Asia Pacific. So welcome. Thank you, Susan. I really appreciate the, uh, the chance to address this, this group. And obviously there's a lot of interest. Um, I'm working for a company called Catalyst Data Management. And just to give you some idea of uh, scope, um, we manage somewhere in the vicinity of around 100 petabytes of data for various uh, uh, customers and clients across the globe. So we are um, uh, have a lot of expertise around managing, managing data, uh, especially on the cloud. And what I want to address today from a data manager's point of view is what the energy transition means for the types of data that we see coming into the systems that we manage and deliver data on for our clients. So I'm gonna, this is part of a larger presentation that I've used for, for similar groups. I'm gonna skim through a couple of the, of the high points. Um, hope everybody can see that. Looks great. Good, excellent. So um, when, as a data manager, when I think about, um, about data in the cloud, I think about what are the business drivers for, for uh, new energy data in particular being on the cloud. And there's, there's uh, some bullet points up there at the top. First of all, obviously there's the energy transition itself and all of the, the shareholder activism where every energy company now has some sort of a new energy, low carbon initiative project division. Um, and also most energy companies have somewhere in their digital function, um, a digital transformation KPI or initiative or, or program. In a lot of cases that has worked its way down the organization to somebody who may not even be sure what that means, but they're charged with executing it. So, and usually that takes the, the form of taking data that maybe wasn't digital before making it available on a digital platform. Um, the other drivers that I see specifically in Southeast Asia are around well data is that a lot of our fields, our brown fields uh, past their production plateau and there's a lot of information being collected and disseminated and shared with government agencies around decommissioning of existing fields. Again, moving away from the old uh, hydrocarbon platforms into new energy. 
um, there is a proliferation of both vendor supplied and open source uh, cognitive compute platforms that allow us to manipulate and analyze that data. And of course, all of the companies that we deal with are doing this with less staff than they had than they had a year ago. In addition, um, again, especially in the Asia Pacific region, we're starting to see um, a lot of mergers and acquisitions where assets and their digital data are being transferred between operators. So the drivers to have that data available on the cloud are, there are some pretty obvious ones, right? All of these companies wanna be able to leverage that tremendous bandwidth that's available on uh, cloud backbones. And that map to the right of your screen there um, is, is basically a map of cloud data center capacity and bandwidth uh, on backbones spanning the globe and, and why companies are not building their own infrastructure, they're leveraging that cloud service provider network. I love that map because I'm over here in Australia in that tiny little uh, disc over there. And Mike, let's see, you're in Casper. So yeah, you're kind of out in the wilderness as far as data centers as well. Um, so companies are, are looking to use that, that cloud, those cloud services to, uh, to scale their infrastructure without investing in a lot of capital themselves. They're looking for that global coverage and they're looking for the kind of packaged data workflows that those cloud service providers can, can, uh, can give them. The allied benefits that they're starting to see that they may not have thought about that we're talking to them about are the fact that when you start storing your data on the cloud, you gain a lot more visibility, a lot more granularity into what does it mean to store multiple petabytes of data? How much does that cost on a day-to-day -day basis? And those were costs that might've been previously buried somewhere in an IT budget. So that helps the whole discussion around why data is important. Um, and we're, as providers of technology, we find that we're able to write reusable code for cloud applications. So we can write a, a data transfer um, JSON script, use it for one type of data. And when a new type of data hits our, our systems, we can very easily uh, reuse that code for a different data type. We're also seeing the value of having these open standards for sharing data across these multiple platforms. So those are the, some of the things that are, that are going on in the cloud space. Um, and just as applicable to existing legacy um, well data and subsurface data as to the new data types. But when we look at the volumes of data that are hitting the systems that we manage today, we are starting to see contributions from a lot of new technologies, right? And some of these you'll probably already be familiar with, right? There's a lot of new data being generated by technologies like artificial intelligence, like machine learning, natural language processing, and on the acquisition side, we've got multiple sensors out in the field that are, that are creating large streams of, of digital data. So I just wanna highlight some of those data types to, to get people thinking. And as you're listening to the rest of the, of the presentations um, this evening, be thinking about some of these extra data types, right? So when I think about large volume subsurface data for new energy, of course, the first thing that, that I think a lot of us think about is seismic data. It's, it's very visible, it's very large. Um, and in fact, it can make up you know, 80, 90% of, of our clients storage volume on the cloud. But um, here are some of the other data types that, that we see entering our systems and that we are asked to manage by our clients. So um, in the decommissioning space, um, a surprising amount of data being taken up on cloud storage by video streams from remote operated vehicles working on decommissioning and subsurface facilities. Um, we've got those machine learning, AI, natural language processing, cognitive compute programs that are um, allowing organizations to look at existing data and repurpose it for things like uh, geothermal reservoirs. And um, we've got those real-time equipment sensors that in some cases are running equipment that is literally generating renewable energy out on the rigs, like, like windmills operating on offshore platforms um, with operational and, and op optimization, real-time data coming in from those sensors. Um, we have satellite um, synthetic aperture radar data that is tied to well locations that is monitoring surface motions that is attributable to CO2 sequestration or hydrogen storage. We have massive data sets coming from distributed fiber downhole 
Um, so this is distributed acoustic and distributed temperature sensing, largely for monitoring CO2 injection into subsurface reservoirs. And that can generate something like a terabyte of data uh, per day per well. So it's really um, uh, creating opportunities for us to, to step in and apply some best practices around, um, around managing that data. And then we've got passive well bore uh, micro seismic, again, for CO2 and, and hydrogen storage. So those are some of the data sets that, that, are, that are closely allied with the new energy transition that we see uh, creating large volumes on, on the systems that, that we manage. I want to give you one um, striking example. <laughs> That's a bit of a pun, uh, from, specifically from Western Australia. So what's the easiest way to repurpose well data on the cloud? So there's a company over here in Western Australia called Strike Energy. Um, they just had a major discovery in the Perth Basin, which is an onshore gas basin here, um, not too far from Perth. Um, and as a result of analyzing the well bore data in that field, they have discovered that by drilling a little bit deeper into the non-gas bearing Permian sands, um, they're encountering water wet sandstones with high heat flow. Um, so their corporate strategy is produce the gas and then drill deeper into the geothermal reservoir and create a sustainable base load energy source for local consumption in Western Australia. To do that, obviously, they have to repurpose all of that well data that they use to make the discovery of the gas and discover how to put that into modeling programs to model the geothermal reservoir. Um, so there's a lot of attention in the Perth Basin now on PVT data, geomechanics and core data from existing wells in that basin as other companies kind of get on the bandwagon and start looking at the, looking at those data sources. So that, that's just a little, a little teaser. Um, Got a lot more, a lot more information, a lot more examples that maybe we can get into during the discussion. But uh, I want you to be thinking about those kind of data types and those kind of opportunities for digital data as as we go through the rest of the presentations and we'll come back at the end and handle some specific questions. Thanks. That's great. Very good. Well, I really appreciate it and. Our uh, next um, person, and in, in, in again, we'll really appreciate what you, you, you introduce and we'll have time at the end for specific questions. So I'd like to um, introduce Vilu Cherian of, of, of Premier. Hey Susan, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. I'll make sure it's, oops. Looks good. All right. Thank you. So I guess uh, the, the topic here again uh, uh, is to look at data techniques and how we bridge in the gap between geology and engineering. Uh, when you read a little bit of what the challenges are, uh, I copied and pasted this off the website. Uh, we're looking to see how we manage the millions of uh, data sets that we have, log, seismic, core, et cetera. Uh, and especially in an environment when we resource challenged, uh, how have technologies enabled us to uh, access information, organize it, et cetera. And I'll show you how, uh, at least under the premier umbrella, we tackling some of these together with our customers. Uh, when we look at challenges in bridging the gaps, uh, there's a couple buckets you can put there. There's a lot of other buckets, but, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I'll focus on a couple is the data. Um, there's a, uh, if we look at in the subsurface, just petrophysics and, and salinities, uh, resistivity of clays, uh, cementation factors, so many unknowns just on doing one domain analysis. Then you go on to geology, versions, seismic uh, propagation, facies, go on to frack modeling, biots, pore pressures. So if you look at every domain on its own, even though we've got gobs of data out there, we still have a lack uh, as individuals. Uh, there's a surplus on a lot of, there's, there's a lot of data, but we still have a lack. So we have a feast famine situation where we don't have enough data to close all the uncertainties, but there's a lot of data out there. 
Then there's the formats, the qualities, et cetera. So there's a lot of challenges around the data. Uh, and over the last couple of years, we've seen challenges on resources. And these are the people. And people lands up become a bigger and bigger uh, issue, especially as we enter in this transition area. Uh, there's the processes and there's software. And a lot of software uh, advancements, software hardware advances have helped some of that uh, on the resources side. Then there's the decision tools. Uh, what are the interpretations that we digest? How do we make decisions? And then when you have those decision tools, how quick is your feedback cycle? Uh, I've published a bunch of papers all talking about how we bridge and how uh, we enable integration between the different domains. When you go from geomechanics to completions, just by ensuring uh, that there is a process in which mechanical earth models are created and multiple realizations are handed over uh, and you ensure every domain captures all the uncertainty to enable the next domain to close the uncertainty through levels of integration. And those uncertainties are then passed in the next domain to further reduce uncertainty. One of the challenges always in the space was a common medium for engineers and reservoirs to talk. Um, about a decade, decade and a half ago, when we used to do simulation, uh, the big challenge was when we would get static models from geosciences, there was the FACES model. And sometimes that would be a disconnect when it went to the engineers in terms of what does geofaces mean in terms of siliceous, argillaceous, mudstones, siliceous, calcareous mudstones. What does that mean from a flow standpoint? Or what does that mean from a frac standpoint? Uh, that disconnect existed for probably the last decade. And uh, recently, one of the things we've used is uh, uh, created data environments where we pool data and enable AI to look and see how the geophases relate to geomechanical phases and how they relate to flow phases. Uh, this is one example of how when uh, the geologists talk about facies and they talk about argillaceous, siliceous mudstone. A reservoir engineer can look at that and say, okay, that's divided into two different subcategories, one with a certain large pore throat, another one that may be more organic rich where the wettability changes are notable. And maybe there's a third and fourth facies where you see difference in terms of pore size distribution, uh, what's bound and movable fluids, and even in terms of poroperm relationships. And the geomechanics engineers can relate that same argillaceous, siliceous mudstone to brittle, ductile, et cetera, uh, and understand where the transition. So everybody all of a sudden starts to talk a common language uh, just based on creating a common backbone that we've talked about and communicated for decades, but struggled to bridge that consistently. Uh, and that's one of the things that I'll talk about. Uh, the other thing that we've addressed in terms of the data is uh, as you get into an environment, uh, business environment, where you challenged from a resource standpoint, uh, if we look at uh, solving something technically, sometimes you need many resources under the geoscience domain. You can have sedimentologists, mineralogists, uh, you can have a bunch of different layers and not every organization can afford that depth. And we've seen with the, again, with commodity prices, how they've changed, how organizations have restructured. So one of the things we've done is created something called collaboration spaces. It's, it's a redo on what's there within consortia. And it basically allows groups of companies and service companies to come together uh, under a business umbrella that allows us to uh, align with common purposes. Uh, for example, if we all are aiming to build a static model, uh, when I deal with company A or company B, companies A's geologist will have specific focus and it won't be intentional, but maybe those geologists uh, are quite focused on mineralogy and how mineralogy changes are affecting geomechanical properties. And in that same space, when I talk to company B, their geologists will be focused on how uh, organic contents are changing and how the organic contents 
uh, influencing gas oil ratios and related to a bunch of other attributes they see when they drill. And you pick, speak to the Fed. So just by bringing all these companies together, you can get a pool of resources uh, that traditionally would be very expensive to get under your own organization. Uh, we've also managed to get all these data companies to create a business environment where they also bring in all their data. So one of the examples is in our Permian space, we've got close to two dozen, more than two dozen members who have brought in three, 4,000 proprietary data sets. This is not stuff that you've scrubbed off the public domain and we're wondering how good the quality but is, but it's their own data sets where they have intimate knowledge on they have tried to work it, they've tried to integrate it, and they're bringing it in. So there's intimate knowledge with the data set. And when you bring all these operators together and service companies together, you land up creating a very rich data set where stakeholders have interest in their data sets, don't quite understand all the aspects of it, but together we can puzzle to get uh, sort of combine it together to uh, reduce uncertainty. Uh, decision tools, uh, I think uh, we've had and we'll probably see a couple of speakers talking at and just kind of mentioned uh, the cloud platforms. Um, for a private equity startup, uh, capital has to be spent very cautiously. It's always return on capital. So going out there, investing in hardware is something that's uh, not, is generally frowned upon. <laughs> uh, and the cloud platform has allowed you to access uh, a vast amount of resources, computational resources, and it's given you flexibility to decide whether you're using for looking for cores or you're looking for GPUs or what sort of RAM you're using for. And it's allowed you to scale up and scale down uh, without, again, seeing that uh, pinch on the wallet side. Uh, and a lot of the software platforms migrating to the clouds has, again, allowed uh, the data to kind of move between the platforms a lot easier. Uh, and when you have all these members around the collaboration space, rather than one operator, uh, if we if we look at ourselves honestly, when, whenever we've been built static models within the technical domains, it's generally taken about two to three years for us to kind of make sense of uh, whether those models are making sense from the operation standpoint. When you bring 10, 20 operators together, because everybody's using it at the same time and you push in a facies model across the entire basin. In some areas, people may not understand if it's facies that we've captured it well, but in another area where it's predominant, that operator will be able to give an immediate feedback. So when you've got 15, 20 guys working the same model at the same time and tying it to the drill bit, the feedback cycle is accelerated tremendously. Uh, so that's one of the things that we've used within Premier is uh, not just the cloud platforms and the data architecture under the cloud, uh, but also the collaborator space environment where we uh, kind of put in a twist to the traditional consulting uh, or consortia roles and trying to create something that leverages all the resources within everybody's uh, organizations to accelerate some of the decision uh, making. So again, Key things we've looked at is AI. We've used it a lot for the QC uh, of data and normalizations, the FACES, which are geological, geomechanical flow minutes. And again, a lot of this has been enabled uh, via our business models. So again, uh, high level summary, uh, the capital and human resource crunch uh, has placed a big emphasis on us. Uh, in, uh, introducing AI to streamline a lot of our existing workflows improve our interaction, uh, integration ability and accelerate the learnings uh, under the collaboration space uh, uh, umbrellas. Uh, I think the current business models uh, in terms of alignment with industry, government, uh, especially when it comes to ESG, a lot of the models that we're building, uh, especially when you're looking at parent child well and traditional production operations, uh, the depletion geomechanics is almost the same thing when you have to start looking at uh, sequestration or injection. Uh, the data sets are there. Uh, and when you look at the ESG side of things, the way we use capital and the way we de uh, deploy resources, again, places a, a lot of emphasis on some sort of a collaborative model. Um, and again, I think uh, better alignment is required uh, just to ensure the success of these models going forward. So that's all I got.
looking forward to the discussion later. Oh, thank you. My, um, my, my screen shifted and I couldn't find the unmute button. Anyway, so, well, thank you, Vila. That was great. And so we'll have a, a, another presentation uh, by Premier with uh, go a little bit more into detail about how to operationalize some of these ideas. The Nathan Ganser is uh, here with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Nathan Ganser. I'm the Vice President of Geology for Premier. Uh, and this is something that's very near and dear to me in terms of uh, preserving uh, public samples and uh, or preserving rock samples. And what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit of our efforts in what we call the public-private partnerships that we're building to aggregate and discover samples. And uh, I just like to start with looking at this first image here, which is uh, a picture uh, from the Midland International Sample Library in the late 1930s. Uh, it was predominantly run by women back then, pre-World War II, and they were uh, bagging and tagging all the samples coming out of the ground. And the first thing that I did when I got involved at Premier was figuring out how to um, create a digital reference uh, for all these 300,000 index cards that have been created by um, these people throughout the last 100 years or so. And I think there's truly a legacy that we need to protect and continue to pass on to future generations of geologists when it comes to samples. Uh, and I know samples are a little bit different from some of the other information that we're talking about, but I do view them as maybe a, our most raw resource when it comes to geologists. Just a quick background on me. I, I started uh, my career about 10 years ago at the Bureau of Economic Geology in the Core Research Center and really was just in awe of how many samples are out there, how much potential information is out there and created a, a startup company called Mud Geochemical after that that was aimed at rapid data generation with uh, Dr. Harry Rowe. Uh, we entered a bigger startup, which is now Premier, and I had, I've had i been lucky enough to be involved in purchasing a private library of over 300,000 samples, now over 500,000 samples that we've collected. And we've built out a sample and data marketplace from that. And there's been a lot of um, trial and error and a lot of education in this in terms of how to build uh, a system that works. And now we're looking at partnering with much larger institutions to build collective libraries. Uh, Texas Tech was our recent partnership. It was an Exxon Mobil donation. The challenge there is, you know, there's an inventory, but how do you how do you actually start to access all these samples? And until Texas Tech, I hadn't really thought about working with other groups. I'd been very monomaniacal about um, owning samples directly, limiting access, forcing people to go through us, building licensing programs around that. And this really opened my eyes in terms of um, how much strength can come from commercial entities, government agencies, and, and universities working together, building off of one another and kind of our, our data terrarium. Um, I think that commercial entities have limits and I'll speak to some of those. Existing government and university libraries are disparate. They're not collected. We all know that, that if you are trying to look for rocks, you're gonna search 50 different databases before you find out that you can't even find the rock you started looking for. And I think a really simple solution to this is a centralized digital infrastructure. There are efforts towards that. Um, I think these data are increasing in value, so preservation is certainly critical. So just very quickly, um, there's a lot of philosophical conversations we could have about uh, the importance of this, but I think the two big ones are the why and the how. Uh, the why is it important? I think we're reaching a point where storage costs are becoming increasingly, um, they're high, and companies are looking to get rid of these materials, so they're throwing them away. I get emails every other day about people trying to donate samples to us, uh, some of which we can't take on, and uh, th there are other alternatives to throw them away. And the reason I think that's interesting is because we're also, we've also just completed what was probably the most prolific um, drilling and, and, you know, creation of subsurface materials over the last century. And we're now seeing that dip down. And even though those soft subsurface materials are of increasing importance, we're gonna have less and less access. And interestingly, a lot of the stuff that comes from 30, 40, 50 years ago are better samples to work with. They were drilled slower, they're bigger chunks when it comes to cuttings or some of the cores. And the cores that are older are interesting for new problems like CCUS. How is probably the harder question to answer uh, because you're talking about something that's very expensive. So how do you create a, a business model that works around that? 
So my objective over the last decade has really been developing the physical, digital, and financial mechanisms to aggregate these rocks and create uh, rock property information that's available to others. And I think what Baloo just mentioned in terms of the collaboration space or any kind of subsurface network is the answer. It's multiple people need to be involved. There are a lot of existing efforts. We probably don't need to dive into all the different uh, geological surveys that exist. Um, but as I mentioned, for private operators, it's becoming more and more expensive. People have individual database concepts that they've come up with. These are hard to link to one another. There are federal efforts. There's the NGGDPP, which is doing very good things. Um, there are uh, universities and state repositories. But everyone has the same common issues, which is that we lack funding and resources to really take this to the next level. There is no common uh, system that's out there. There often isn't a digital infrastructure. If you deal with one of the bigger repositories, you might be lucky enough to have a mapping system you can, touch, you can tap into, but otherwise it might be Excel or it might be just a curator who's been there for 30 years that knows it. So we need to overcome this as our first step. And I think we need to keep it very simple and just get to a point where we can view all samples on a map, regardless of where they are, um, just to know that they're there. My first attempt at this uh, started in 2017, 2018 with the creation of DataStack with the help of uh, our friends at Wellog Data. Uh, the, the goal here was to create a marketplace where we had a funding mechanism where it would pay for the creation of data, the hosting of data. We would know how to be able to go out and collect other information that we thought was valuable about rock samples that were out there. And I'd say that overall, um, it was a really good learning experience uh, over the first couple of years of realizing that creating a, a private, you know, having a single business that we create value through commercialization of a private repository does start to educate you on the cost of storage itself, uh, the geographic limitations and, and um, speed or variety for data generation limitations that exist by being a single unit. And you've, you've somewhat created a wall for accessibility. Um, so, you, you know, those are things that we, we wanted to overcome. In our more recent version, you know, this library network that's come about as a product of all this, uh, what we can see is that we've been able to substantially increase our footprint of samples from hundreds of thousands to millions of samples that are out there, as well as interpretation. Um, the goal is to utilize multiple locations that are out there, especially existing repositories, um, for storage and to distribute the cost and minimize logistics for shipping samples, but to use one common platform to be able to view these in. Uh, you can have a greater geographic and stratigraphic collection. You can share the cost for functionality development as long as things are understood that they're needed. Uh, and you can open that up to other labs and service companies. So labs and service companies that historically generate, you know, transactional single, single well proprietary data can now create entire data sets, contextual data sets that can be leveraged by other groups. Uh, I think that we need to adopt common practices regarding IP. That's one of the biggest sticking points that we run into in the data distribution world. And the financial incentives and mechanisms for cost recovery. I think there's a huge motivation here for operators to not have to pay for storage anymore. Um, and I think that you can create low cost data solutions that are out there where, where royalties help feed the repositories. I think it's also more than just a, you know, there's an obvious uh, component here where we get calls daily about wells that someone needs to work on for, you know, some, some merger and acquisition that they're about to do. And they wanna know if we have data or if we can generate data or samples. And that's great for oil and gas today. I think there's the obvious future subsurface exploration that's already been, you know, addressed by several groups when it comes to carbon capture, sequestration, geothermal, hydrological stuff or having, having all these samples is, is extremely valuable uh, beyond the obvious side of needing to better understand the planet to be able to uh, take advantage of those resources. Uh, there's also the side of this that's the ESG component where uh, these are this is actively creating funding mechanisms, like in the case of Texas Tech, where it's creating scholarships for students, uh, it's creating a funding mechanism for the growth of the library itself, where the money goes back to the library. Uh, it also is preserving these subsurface samples that I think all of us can get behind and think is important. And it's really informative for subsurface resources in the future, mitigating things like climate change. So if there's any kind of conclusions on this, I, I hope everyone <laughs> thinks that rock samples are valuable and that we need to preserve them. And if you ever want to talk about that, I'm very available. Uh, I think operators, laboratories, and libraries can all rethink the way that they've approached storing these materials in the past. 
and we can do a uh, we can we can create a better business model together that is advantageous for all. Um, I think the first step is very much building a subsurface platform uh, for the libraries that are out there, and uh, and having all all different parts of that triangle: commercial, education, and uh, government working together to build that. So that's it. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Nathan. I I love this. I mean. Uh, I, I totally agree with you that these, just because of the space and the, and the tendency to just get rid of things, um, well, these are, all of our samples will be extremely rare. And um, you br bring up a lot of different wonderful issues. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, well, we'll um, hold off on commenting more until the, the you know, end of the session. So I'd like to introduce Sashi Gunturu, who will talk to us about some of the challenges of, of managing data architecture and opportunities, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Uh, okay. So can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, so I'd like to talk about uh, how we can uh, build uh, data warehouses at scale, and how you can build a unified data platform. So we have been working with a few tech companies and I wanted to share our, uh, how we leverage some of their platforms to build uh, the subsurface uh, link house. Uh, so if you look at the, the computing evolution uh, since the last 20 years, uh, we have moved from client server applications to cloud microservices, and now everything is a managed service in the cloud. Um, and then, the, there has been a big advent of uh, distributed computing so that you can now process, you can build clusters, large scale clusters in the cloud and also have high performance uh, computing in the cloud. And the advantage is uh, you have now come up with the paper use models. So where you pay for the paper, the compute units, and also you can build scalable clusters. So that way uh, all of these costs would eventually turn into an OPEX cost like because of you're only using paper use models. So, and then you have all the data challenges where the data is continuously growing and you have remote connectivity problems and you have time constraints. Can you, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes absolutely, yes. Okay. Yep, yep, you're going good. Yeah. Um, so if you look at the current, uh, challenges with the, uh, with the data solution. So if you look at the data warehouse, uh, the current data warehouses it is more for structured data. There is no support for video or audio. And there is most of the data is stored in a centralized blob storage. And if you look at the, the, the data lakes that are already there, so they are complex to set up and eventually they're very hard to manage. So in the last few years, uh, there has been what is called uh, how you can build scale with distributed computing. So in the last 20 years, there have been a lot of open source projects like one from UC Berkeley where they started the whole Apache Spark where you can now build a distributed computing. And also there have been a lot of open source projects like MLflow and uh, PyTorch and all of those in the machine learning. And then uh, there have been commercial applications uh, that have adopted this open source into the, data, uh, into the commercial platform. So the reason, so there has been a big shift in how the compute is taking place, whether it's edge computing or cloud computing. There is a lot of uh, open source projects and there are commercial offerings. So with the open source projects, you have a lot of, uh, a whole community is building uh, the solution for you. So if you see the latest advances in the distributed computing, it has come from the open source. And then you have commercial companies like Databricks that have taken that and implemented that. If you look at the latest evolution of of what Microsoft did with uh, Azure Synapse, it has taken the open source stack and built for distributed computing. So there is a big uh, uh, way of how you can adapt some of the open source platforms and then build and, uh, and utilize for commercial use. And also how uh, the cloud providers also moving data from source to sync. For example, you have Amazon that is providing a whole bunch of data pipelines. So there is a clear connectivity between on-prem data sources and into the cloud. And same thing you have with the Azure uh, workspace as well. So where you have the Azure data factory that can move the data from on-prem to the cloud. So 
not only for the compute, but there is also a streamlined approach of moving data and aggregating data. So if you look at the distributed computing, the Spark architecture, so you essentially have a worker node and a driver node. So it's like going to a movie theater, you have one counter versus five counters so that you can process the data faster. So you have multiple cluster options like memory optimized, storage optimized, compute optimized, and also the GPU based uh, solutions for uh, distributed computing. So in the last uh, four or five years, there has been a new architecture that is being introduced called the lake house architecture. So this gives you a, the best of all the solutions from data mart to data warehousing to data lake, where you can take all the structured data, semi-structured data, and then you can build a open, uh, like uh, it uses the cloud storage uh, and it also uses the distributed computing. Then you can do analytics, you know, data science or all the machine learning models. So we have been looking at these technologies and how we can apply that uh, to the subsurface delta, uh, subsurface uh, models. So the advantage with the, with the lake house is it gives you, uh, it is supported by all the three flat cloud providers like AWS, Azure, and Google. And it can take the structured and semi-structured data and also streaming data. Let us say you have data coming from wells in real time and you have a 3D subsurface model. So if you want to do a real-time uh, pore pressure or real-time real geomechanical model for a new side track, so now this is possible when you have a unified uh, data lake. Uh, or uh, in this case, it's called the Delta Lake. And the good thing with this approach is you can scale quickly and it's also pay per use. Uh, so as you're getting more and more data, uh, you pay for the storage and you also pay for the compute as well. So you don't have to have a, a big cluster right up front. So you can scale accordingly as per your needs. Um, and also the good thing with this architecture would be you have a entire data life, life cycle for example, all the raw data, let us say you have a whole bunch of formation tops with all the duplicates and everything. So you can store the raw data in what is called the data life cycle. In this case, bronze is the raw data. And the silver is where you can clean up all the data. Like for example, you can remove all the duplicate logs, duplicate formation tops. For example, with well logs, you have you know, a lot of null values, all those things you can clean up. And the goal will become uh, the final version that you are actually using for analytics. And the good thing is with this approach, you have, you're maintaining the audit of the entire data all the way from raw to the fully processed data. Because typically people will say, I have a UCS that is being computed. Where was the original source of the data, right? So with this, you can capture all of that uh, with this approach. Um, and, and the beauty of this format is it's using an open format. Like if, for example, the Apache Parquet and Apache Avro, these are the open formats. That is, uh, that is supported by Apache uh, Foundation. And the Delta Lake format is using this parquet files and also the transaction logs. And the good thing is once it is stored, uh, you can also do a time travel. Let us say you have a data in 2020 versus 2021. And let us say something was got corrupted in 2021. You can always go back to your 2020 data. So that means you can also have uh, the, not only the audit, but also the time travel of how your data is evolving over time. And then you can go back because all of these are version controlled. So the commercial versions like the Databricks platform, they have taken this open source and they have built their own proprietary code and they have adapted these technologies across, across the industries, all the way from finance to genomics to disease prediction to all kinds of stuff. Uh, and recently they've also uh, broken the world record in terms of the data warehousing where they have processed 100 terabytes of data and they have done 32 million queries against this 100 terabytes of data. So the cloud computing with the lake house approach and also the distributed computing, um, you can have an open source version depending on the need, but also have a commercial version for scale, right? And also the support. So this, this tells you like, for large scale computing, let us say you're doing a geomechanical simulation for 20 days that can run for 20 days. Now with the advent of this cluster computing, you should be able to reduce the time significantly, right? Uh, so again, it's pay per use, right? You don't have to use that cluster all the time. So, so how does all of this theory translate into 
the, the subsurface data, right? So now let's look at the, the, the data lake, how it can be applied for the subsurface. As we all know, you have all the documents, uh, the unstructured data, you have all the structured data like SegWi, LAS, WitsML, all these uh, standardized formats. And then you also have the restricted data, like people have proprietary data formats that they have in their own databases. So you have all of that. Uh, so given that, you can now aggregate all of this uh, into the Delta Lake, and I'll show you in a, in, in a quick demo how it all looks like. Uh, the idea is you can take seismic data, you can take well logs, you can take uh, the core, core samples, and all of that and store in one single data warehouse. The advantage with this open format is you'll be able to store images, GIS data, all of that. And not only that, because you have the ability to correlate, you now have for a given depth sample, do you have seismic, do you have gamma logs, do you have core data? So you'll be able to correlate because ultimately all of this will act like a database where you can query, manage, and govern. So that is how the, the, the lake house architecture works. And this is an example of how you can take all the different kinds of data from on-prem to the cloud. Again, as I mentioned, where you can use the data factory, you can migrate the data into the cloud, again, using a distributed cluster. Again, there are options where you can use the open source uh, Apache Spark or a commercial version, and then you can aggregate into store. And the good thing with this architecture, it, it is cloud agnostic. So the same architecture would work on Google Cloud and AWS and also in Azure. So you don't have to change, re-architecture your whole uh, software development uh, lifecycle in this case. Again, we, so the advantage with, again, with Spark, it supports multiple languages. So for example, you can use Python, you can use Scala, you can use R, you can use SQL. Um, and you can also embed your own, let us say you have a code, that proprietary code algorithm that is written in Java. So that can be also be deployed on the cluster and run as a proprietary algorithm. Uh, again, this goes through the entire life cycle, how you can cleanse the data and populate into the Delta Lake, again, depending on where your life cycle of the data is. So this is an example of how we have implemented. So this is what is called, we call the energy Delta Lake. So where uh, we have uh, the population of all the raw data, all the way from seismic to, uh, to well logs, to core data, uh, also to the distributed acoustic sensing as well. So all of the data is stored in the Delta Lake um, where we cleanse the data and prepare the data. And then we have our own libraries that can do a query against this database, this uh, data warehouse. And then you have like BI tools like you now, like Looker and Power BI, though you can use those or you can build your own proprietary uh, solutions. So once you have all of these, you have to do this again and again, right? So the advantage with the Spark clusters is you can also schedule a job. So for example, let us say I'm getting um, your well logs every, every month or new kinds of core data or seismic every year. So you can process, you can schedule a job like here is an example where uh, I have a notebook that is scheduled to run this pipeline. So you can go through all these pipelines. You can automate all of these using the, the cloud native, uh, you know, data factory and those kind of things. So the clusters, the Spark clusters and the Spark jobs, they all work in tandem with the cloud infrastructure, the microservices. So let me give you a quick demo how all this theory translates into reality. So this is the Databricks environment. So where we have a, for example, a training cluster. So this is, it has two worker nodes, uh, two driver nodes, uh, sorry, one, one driver node and two worker nodes. And there is what you call an auto scaling. Let us say you have a high computing job, it scales up to four worker nodes. Um, so if you want to create a new cluster, this is the advantage. So now I can scale up to a really high performing cluster. So for example, here, um, You can have ML, genomics, these kind of different clusters. And you can have high concurrency clusters. Uh, you can build multiple clusters. And here you can see how you can scale it. Like for example, I can build a, a 52 gigabyte memory cluster, eight core cluster. So you can scale all the way 
to a very, very high performance computing. Like for example, if you're doing a geomechanic simulation, you want to do a reservoir simulation, you can really build a very high performance cluster. Again, all of these are a bunch of clicks that you can uh, do. Again, you have a combination of you know, compute optimized. In some cases, do you want more memory to do the computation? Do you want more compute power or do you want high IO? In that case, you want to do an SSD uh, cluster. All of that can be configured so the, the advantage with the cloud-based approach is you can quickly build up a cluster, high-performance computing cluster uh, very quickly without having to manage. Uh, so that is a microservice, managed microservice provided by one of these commercial companies. So in this case, I'm running a, a training cluster here. And this is the S3 bucket where I have the data stored in the Amazon S3 bucket. And here you see, we have all the different data sets like the DTS data, the DAS data, the GIS data, we have the geothermal data. And if you look at all the core data samples, we have all the images here. Uh, so essentially the cloud storage acts like your data store. And then you have the Delta Lake, go back here. So this is the subsurface lake house. So you have uh, the subsurface Delta Lake. So here you have the bronze and silver and all kinds of uh, the, the, the sequence of the data life cycle. And then you can store all the data like well logs, all of these into the, uh, into the storage. So you don't need a separate database like a SQL server database. You can use the Delta Lake as your data, data store as well as the query engine. So what, what the cloud computing or the microservice with Spark also offers is you can now have, these are all the jobs. For example, here I'm doing all a, ge a bunch of geomechanical calculations like the breakout weight, collapse pressure, all of these are a bunch of jobs that you can run. You can schedule a job to run. And then you also have, uh, here is where you have the, the, the databases. So essentially the Delta Lake will translate into a queryable table. Like here I have the wall data set with seismic, uh, the image data, the GIS data, the drilling reports, all of these can be stored as a queryable interface. Because most of the time, the challenge you have is, once I correlate, can I query uh, uh, immediately, right? So the idea is, if I'm looking at the subsurface data, I need to have information, quick access to information across all of the subsurface data. So for example, if I have a well path in a seismic cube, can I quickly retrieve the properties along the well board? Like can I retrieve a seismic attribute along the well board? So those are the challenges. and with this approach, you are able to now, let us say you have like five terabytes of seismic data or hundred terabytes of seismic data. So the way you scale is you build a bigger cluster and you scale it. If you have like only hundred gigabytes, you use the corresponding cluster. And also it's all pay per use, right? So then in this case, say for example, here you have a compute. Um, so I can also turn off like after 120 minutes here, it turns off, if there is no activity, it turns off the cluster, right? So that is how you can use the pay-per-use mechanism for scaling up your compute. So once you have the data, so all of this data is now passed being uh, with, a, with a bunch of notebooks, the Spark notebook. So if somebody is good at Python, they can build PySpark. So PySpark will give you the distributed computing structure, right? So the advantage with this approach is you have a cluster uh, which will support distributed computing. So all you need to do is focus on your logic and build on, on top of it. Oh, this is great, Ashi. I think we're kind of out of time. Oh, okay. sorry. Yeah. No, yeah. no, if you have a, a, a last yeah. slide, can you show the yeah. conclusions? Yeah, so ultimately all of this boils down to something like this. So, so we have applications where you can scale up, like here is an example of the seismic that is querying against the Delta Lake, and you have all the geomechanical properties that you compute, you can scale. So every query is going against the Delta Lake and, and visualizing all this information. Similarly, you have the distributed acoustic sensing. Here is where you have the DAS data. Again, this is for a pipeline. So where you have a pipeline, you have the DAS data along the pipeline, right? So the advantage is I'm able to take all the data from different sources and I'm able to correlate in order to come up with a best possible representation of your subsurface and also the ability to query against it, right? So. That's amazing, yeah. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. I mean, there's so much. I, I, I'm looking forward to a, a longer presentation that we'll have, and we're hoping to have some some courses on these too. So that's this is a really good first step. Yeah. So, 
Anyway, well, thank you. And our last speaker is Brian McDowell. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for, uh, <laughs> I was supposed to go first and I've been kind of busy the last couple of days. So uh, I recycled a couple of slides from last time because mainly because I like them. Uh, mine's going to be pretty short and sweet, everybody. So, you know, before we get into this, um, you know, what we're doing, Sabata Energy Consultants, my company, uh, I, or I should say it's not my only company, my company. I started it last year. Um, we've gotten some more partners and grown quite a bit. Um, but we're really doing kind of blue collar uh, data, if you even want to call it data science, but really kind of the data stuff. Um, so we're based out of Midland, Texas. What I'm going to go through today is just show you all kind of what we're doing. Actually, Blue and uh, Nathan actually set us set me up pretty well um, for essentially we're, we're building this kind of yellow pages of oil and gas data. So as they both mentioned and, and Jess mentioned as well, there's a real problem in oil and gas for data, and there has been for a while, is that as a lot of things, you know, cloud prices have gotten down, uh, just hardware in general's uh, prices have gone down. Um, and pretty much everybody is trying to monetize or digitize their old paper data sets or even digital data sets in one way or the other. Um, the problem is, is that you have wildly varying degrees of completeness and quality between all these different places. I kind of break this down to where you have really kind of five main categories where oil and gas is data is available. Uh, the big one is the regulatory agencies. That's usually the biggest in most places that except for Texas, where we just kind of willy-nilly. Um, after that, you've got kind of the, obviously operators have a lot of uh, in-house data. You have service companies, uh, universities, universities to a lesser extent, and Nathan kind of mentioned this. Universities, for the most part, usually tend to focus, when you do see big collections, a lot of times it's more on rock than it is on uh, like paper data. Uh, so well logs, completion cards, scout tickets, so on and so forth. Uh, there's actually a lot of energy libraries out there too. I think people really forget how much data is really out there in the world that's just on paper. And then finally you have private collections. So private collections, I'm just talking about, you got the geologists have been working in this one basin for 40 years and has a garage just totally full to the brim with uh, strip logs and uh, maybe some old well logs and stuff like this. What we're really trying to do, at least on the high level for Sabata is really kind of bring all these things together. It's a pretty ambitious goal. Um, and like Nathan and Baloo and them mentioned earlier, a lot of people have, have really started down this path. Um, we're actually going to go live with our first round of this for clients, uh, hopefully tomorrow night, um, if I can get enough coffee in me tonight. So what we're trying to do, at least on this first round, is go after all of essentially all the stashes of acorns that all the squirrels have stashed away <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me, and try to get it into at least one data table. Um, some places it's easier than others. Other places, like a lot of the libraries and even some universities and stuff, literally have no list of what they have in-house. I mean, I'm talking about organizations with millions of documents where there's no lists. Um, a good example is our library we purchased last December in Midland. We're about to reopen here uh, hopefully next month. 1.5 million pieces of paper and literally not even an Excel sheet of what's in there. I mean, it's really like kind of a grab bag. You buy it. Uh, it's like a pinata, right? You bust it open and you really see, you know, how good a candy uh, they bought um, um, once it's all broken. So I want to talk a little bit. Uh, our really kind of bread and butter, what we're doing is going through and going after what we call like the dark data, right? So data that's either on paper or it's on like, say, PDFs. It's on a network drive that or a USB or something like that that no one's really using, right? Um, for us, we've kind of developed this workflow in house to go and index paper data and try to automate that process as fast as possible. Uh, we've actually got three different pilot projects going right now. One with the middle energy library. We're kicking off another one with the Denver library, uh, uh, Denver energy resources library next week. And then hopefully another one here in Plano um, um, this month as well. So the way I look at this is, and again, I'm going to go after this, a physical data standpoint is you have two really fundamental tasks Anytime you're trying to catalog anything paper, right, is number one that you have to create a unique identifier, preferably something that's not related to API number. I know that's really controversial, but it's depending on the state. Some states didn't start using APIs till the 70s, i.e. Texas. Other states have back allocated stuff all the way to the beginning of time, right? So we have a unique code system that we use in-house where essentially it tells you uh, this first code, which I'm, I apologize, this is really small. First code tells you the database, 
023 means this came from the Middle Energy Library. The second one is the collection, comes out of their Mudlog collection. Excuse me, the third is the data type. So for them, uh, number one means Mudlogs, and then finally you need code, right? And the last thing is you got to create an image, right? And the way I think of images for physical data is a lot like seismic, right? We can reprocess. But once you have that raw data, uh, you can reprocess it over and over and over again, right? So as we build uh, better processing workflows, essentially clipping the data, straightening it, running OCR, so the text recognition, all these things, as you get it better, we can just go back out to the cloud, grab those raw images, reprocess it, update the database, and go on our merry way all over again, right? Um, the one thing I do want to put here, which I think is really cool and I think is pretty unique to us, is we use QR codes for everything. You know, traditionally, you'll see barcodes. Um, and the reason for that is, one, QR codes are a lot harder to corrupt than barcodes. You can actually take a pencil or even take a blurry image, um, and QR codes will still usually read correctly unless you really mess them up. Number two is uh, you can put way more information uh, on a QR code than you ever can a barcode. You can put websites, you can put all sorts of metadata in there. And number three, thanks to COVID, uh, QR uh, functionality is native to everyone's phone now, right? Remember when we couldn't even get menus in the restaurant or anything like that, you had to fumble around, do the awkward thing. We're all staring at our phone during dinner, right? Um, and because of that, anybody and everybody has a little computer in their thing where you can read it. And for us, we're going through and we're using the QR codes just to tag data. That's cool and all. It doesn't really do a whole lot though. But the beauty of this is we're coming back around and we're going. We're building iPhone apps where that you can be in a library, you can scan that with your iPhone off of our app in the library, say here in Midland, and you can see all of the data that's related to that well um, across 50 different collections across the US, um, or maybe it's just down the street, or maybe there's 10 records right there, right? Um, it's just a really interesting kind of new way that we've been trying to go after this. There's no hardcore data science or anything behind this. This is, again, just kind of blue collar, uh, kind of blue collar databasing. Um, but we think it's pretty unique. And it's, it's even for us, it's been really helpful so far. So to give you the, the real, real high level kind of workflow, uh, we do our geo, uh, excuse me, image processing with a, another startup called Geolumen in Austin, Texas. Um, <clears throat> buddy of mine from School of Mines. And for us, what we'll do is we take those well logs, we'll stick, put on a sticker, little QR code here. We got a very fancy setup, uh, it's called an iPhone and, and a, a little ring camera like everybody on Instagram, right? And we take a photo of that, we scan that image. After that, uh, Geolumina, they take that image, it goes to their servers. Uh, they crop the image just based off of this contrast here and then do some processing where it enhances it. Essentially just, essentially takes all this kind of yellowish color out turns it white and then brings everything out as kind of a darker as a black or a darker blue, right? Super simple stuff, right? But the way we looked at this, we're actually running the numbers now. If I got a thousand well logs, if I want to scan those well logs, a thousand well logs, if you're really good, right? You could do it in probably about 160 hours. Okay. Um, and depending on what people charge you, cost you probably around 10 to $15,000 to do it. In contrast, doing this sort of thing, we're saying like, well, we don't need to scan everything. We just need to have a catalog of what's there. We can go through and do this process, or really anybody can. Um, we could do that same thousand in 40 hours, so a quarter of the time, and frankly, 80, uh, excuse me, 15% of the cost, right? And it doesn't really matter if you're looking at a thousand logs, right? Because like, well, I'm just going to scan everything. Well, if you're looking at like, say, the Midland Energy Library, right, that has maybe 3 million well logs, um, that adds up very, very, very quickly. You know, and what we're doing with our library plus these pilot projects we're looking at, we're looking well at 10 to 15 million logs, right? Um, it's this, uh, you know, we joke that, um, and it's not really a joke, everything we work in is in cents and seconds, right? We're trying to cut costs by one penny and by one second because over a million, over a million records, that adds up quickly. And the cool thing is by doing all this, you can do the same thing to the digital data. So as we go through and we scrape digital well logs, this is a raw TIFF file. This is from New Mexico, just straight off the OCD website. We go through and uh, Matt Bauer, who's our VP of uh, Spatial Analytics, really good Python guy, will go through and actually does this digital watermark with our little QR code or whoever else that frankly looks exactly the same. And when you put all these things together, and this is a really, really small, um, once you get these all in one big data table, you can't tell the difference, right? It all looks the same. 
And you can go out here and we host these images we're hosting now on Amazon uh, Web Services. Um, you know, and you can click through and see a header of a digital file that got pulled from New Mexico or a photograph that we took in an energy library. It looks exactly the same. On a table, there's no difference, right? Even better, you can take all of that, throw it up on a map, and you can get all this and see everything that's there. So what you're seeing here is actually a, is a complete hodgepodge of about 30 different websites. 99% of this is public or publicly available, right? Oops, excuse me. Um, and all we've done is pull everything together, essentially digest it, regurgitate it back up into a more or less standardized format. And then you can see it all on the map, right? So right now with this, we're about to go live, hopefully, like I said, tomorrow, uh, 1.34 million records. Took us about 18 months to get this point. Um, and we'll probably double this before the end of the year. Um, it's pretty amazing. A lot of people poo-poo on the public data, but it's pretty amazing how much stuff is out there. Um, I would say really, we talk about dark data. The old adage is 95% of data is dark. I think that's way too high, but I do think probably for oil and gas, you're probably looking closer to 50%. Um, and I've got a slide I could show you with like, say New Mexico Tech, which Nathan had a, uh, their logo up there. You know, we're about to release a copy of their well log list, 100,000 logs, can't even find it on their website. And we asked them how much of this overlaps with the regulatory agency. Well, we, we have no idea, right? I mean, literally have no idea. Well, I mean, we can pull this together, cross plot everything. It took us about 30 minutes and we can say, well, 70% of your library overlaps with data that's out there, which means more importantly, 30% does not. And if you're a library and you're trying to go through data preservation, you don't want to spend time scanning logs that have already been scanned, right? You want to scan logs. You want to scan the high value stuff. And little things like this, it doesn't seem like much, um, but you can really focus your efforts very, very, very quickly and much more efficiently. And frankly, we use it internally too, because then if I know the Middle Energy Library has this or New Mexico Tech, I'm not going to go scan that log in-house for our per uh, library. There's, there's no reason to, right? And frankly, I mean, at that point, you could probably just chunk the paper, right? Again, you know, as the oil field gets leaner and leaner, you got to start cutting costs one way or the other. If you got duplicate data as everybody else that's already been digitized, then why hold on to it? Okay, and I'll wrap it up. You know, why is this stuff relevant? This is from two weeks ago. Um, you know, it's easy, easier than ever to leverage manpower versus programming in, in cloud computing. We use a lot of different services, uh, and we are not partners with any of these folks. These are just really good products that you can use for cheap as an individual. I mean, our company... Uh, over the last year has grown from essentially a, gar uh, a garage band, you know, to a dive bar band, right? We're still pretty small. We're very hungry. We get a lot done. You know, we're trying to get this first stuff out there to really grow, but you can get a long ways with a little bit of money. Uh, you know, like we just pushed, uh, if y'all are on LinkedIn, we literally just migrated a million well logs that like, well, just shy, 972,000 well logs in eight days uh, using two people and 10 virtual machines on Azure. And it cost us, I think, a whopping 1500 bucks, right? Four terabytes of data. It is, with a little bit of code, you know, it's pretty amazing what even a, a few people can do. And I really think this is, a lot of us have been limited by IT. And so we really can't see our full potential out there. But, you know, and I've put these in there. It's the last time. This will be in the recording. I'm not going to spend time. But this is kind of the stuff that we use that we've really stress tested. Again, we're not partners. It's just for those of you all that are independents and doing this on your own, or anything like that. These are really great products that have helped us tremendously and really moved us up the line much faster than we could have otherwise. Um, so with that, that's all I've got. Like I said, short and sweet, hopefully it's slightly entertaining um, and appreciate y'all's time. Thanks, Susan. Oh, thank you. It's super, super useful and, and, and interesting. So now we have some time for some, some uh, questions from and comments. So I'm going to look at the chat. And let's see. Well, Amy, um, um, Amy has a really interesting, Amy Fox has a really interesting comment. Would you like to make it a comment, Amy? Turn on your. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> everyone. Yeah, no, I just, that, that last comment about poo pooing on public data really resonated with me because when I first moved to Canada, my US employer said I couldn't use the public data, which turned off all my Canadian clients. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, and I'll, I tell you, there's a lot of there's a lot of billionaires that have been made off of very cheap paper data and public data, honestly, or for sure millionaires. I think the other thing, and I saw your comment earlier about the Canadian data too. Um, 
you know, Canada does a great job of publishing stuff out. And we're, you know, I didn't have Canada on that map, but we have Canadian data. We'll be uh, putting out there pretty soon. So keep an eye out for that if anybody else is interested. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah it's not cool. perfect, but it's data and it's there, right? Data's so, data, right? Yeah, I mean, if you're absolutely. if you're bootstrapping a thing with a couple of people, you can go a long ways, you know. <laughs> so I'll make a comment, uh, Amy. I mean, uh, in the collaboration space, uh, we've been, uh, again, we, we want to build a, uh, client-driven build models around the basin. Um, we initially started off with all the members' proprietary data sets. Uh, when you bring in all the members' proprietary data sets, um, you understand the login, the conditions it was logged at, uh, and in some cases, if it's a resistivity log, if it's induction, uh, a ladder log, when different vendors and when something is off, you can understand why. Uh, our first phase from 2016 to 2018 was to build all these models, validate them with production, microsize, make just multi-domain. Uh, now we're at the stage of trying to bring in uh, the public data. Uh, and it's not a simple process because when you bring in public data, um, when we look at a couple of digitization companies, uh, we find there's a lot of science in digitization. Um, I never understood it uh, fully. You bring in digitized data from three different folks. Uh, the resistivity has a slightly different reading between three different digitization companies. And that changes my water saturation by up to 15%, which implies I'm making 20, 30% more water or within 5%. You bring in the porosity logs you bring in induction, you don't know if it's an induction, you don't know if it's a ladder. Uh, so the way you bring in data sets from public repositories, public repositories versus the proprietary repositories, there's a phase when geomechanics are a lot more complicated uh, with all the production that's around. Some of the, when you build in a static model, it's always referenced to same time frame. And when you bring in again, uh, public logs, understanding the vintage, and again, how to normalize to some reference time relative to how much production has occurred is a really complicated process. Uh, so uh, I would say, yes, getting, we're all about getting as much data as possible, but you have to be really careful about how you bring in the data and how to understand uh, how these different te techniques integrate because of the time component. Uh, uh, the, yeah, so uh, I don't know if other folks want to comment, but uh, that's been our experience on uh, building these subsurface static models. Is... Yeah, I'll, I'll drop a note in there. Um, a lot of countries that we operate in here have regulations where data becomes uh, open file or public domain after a certain number of years. Um, and what we find is yes, there's a, there's a different level of quality and confidence in that data and it needs to be flagged in that data curation, the data ingestion process that was described a couple of times so that users can pick the data that's fit for purpose for the type of analysis they're doing, right? Um, and that's, that's where a lot of the data, the data governance and data management best, best practices come in and making the, that quality and confidence rating or calculation available to end users of the data. So all, you know, all data has value, but not all data is created equal. So yeah, you need to, you need to know whether it's fit for a purpose for the business decision that you're trying to make. It's super interesting. Um, so I, I, I wonder too, and I wonder if like maybe Nathan could, could speak to this. Like, okay, so when you're integrating all these huge data sets and, and they are absolutely <laughs> all, all types, all different kind of ways of describing cores and samples. I mean, do you, what do you start with? Do you start with the with the cores with like the strip log that goes with it, or like how do you tie it all together? 
but we're, we're mostly focused on the rock samples and the rock properties and in, in my particular area i think you know brian is actually maybe the other side of the coin from what i've been going after uh, in a lot of ways we're doing the same thing with two different two very different data sets but for, for me personally i start with any information that gives me locational information and then information about the depths that are covered or the direction of the well if I can get that, I can make it useful. If I can't get that, then it's just, it's a paperweight at that point. Um, <laughs> from there, we from there we start to look into the types of data that's been generated. So like the USGS or the NGGDPP, um, or there's a couple other groups actually that do this, where they go out and they've created catalogs of all the PDF files that exist. So there are images of all the lab reports. So what we do is we sort those into all the different types of data that are generated. So it could be bitronite reflectance, thermal maturity, whatever it is. And similar to what Brian explained, we'll have a coding system that breaks down the type of data that we're collecting, the institution that it came from, and then different parts of that information that we're capturing. And what we try and do with it is actually digest it to a point where we're making it into tabular data sets so that our clients can just extract that information right away and populate it into a model. As a PDF, it's, it's a lot more to dig through. Uh, so, yeah, so for me, um, a lot of it is, you know, starting with an initial review of does the inventory already exist or how hard is it to get to an inventory? And of the things that are inventoried, how hard is it to turn it from a hard copy or a rock into a piece of useful digital information? And that that is a very broad spectrum of evaluation that we go through. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, we're doing echoing. Oh, well. <laughs> So I, I'm wondering also, um, there's some comments about the subscription versus ingestion kind of model. Would anybody like to talk about how um, the, the business model works? Yeah, I guess from our side, uh, uh, we, we do a little bit of everything. Um, most folks, I would say, in the capital environment we are in now, uh, most folks tend to lean towards subscription, um, uh, unless, uh, yeah, uh, there's very few cases where uh, you get paper copy. Uh, I mean, um, outright buying data. Uh, there, there is short-term paper use around the software side of things. So when we enable software platforms under the cloud, uh, at that point it's paper use because you may be pulling cores or you may be pulling CPUs, um, at which point we have to pass the costs on. Uh, Amazon will bill us or, or Google will bill us. Uh, and at that point that has to be passed on. Uh, so it depends what the services, uh, if it's, uh, especially if it's pulling a lot of, uh, hardware behind the scenes, uh, then uh, that may be also paper use. But all of them are, Nathan, I don't know, or even uh, 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 Brian, I, I think you kind of mentioned also online some of your comments. Yeah, I mean, so we're, uh, our data directory is going to be subscription based, but I mean, it's going to be like 50 bucks a month. I mean, our idea is that we're trying to, anybody can afford it, like, you, you know, even you know, anybody that's independent got laid off, whatever. Right. Um, as far as the, the data itself. So like actual copies of the logs and stuff like that. Um, ours is, is you buy it, you own it. Um, I'm personally, we're staying away from the data leasing because, you know, I, at least on the well log side, I think a lot of people are tired of it, you know, from the well log side, which is totally different than what, you know, uh, which is totally different than what premier is doing with the core data. Right. Um, just because you spend a lot of money on that stuff and then you, if you get to pay the bill one year, oops, it's all gone. <laughs> uh, the other thing too is partially it's because our client base is, you know, we're not really going after the billion dollar companies. We're really going after the independents. And by independents, I'm not talking about like the Devons or the pioneers or anything like that. Like I'm talking about like independent geologists, right? And so for us, you know, for like public stuff, we could resell it for 50 bucks like everybody else, but why, you know, um, it's not, there's a big difference between selling to an individual versus selling to a billion dollar company, right? as far as like uh, uh, data transparency and delivery and uh, consistency and all that stuff. So, I mean, ours is like a couple bucks, right? We're effectively, if you ever go into an oil and gas library, like an energy library, we've 
taking that exact same business model and then just scaling it up with the digital twist, right? Is that you go in, you purchase a copy, you own the copy from there on out, right? Um, you know, you can get the geotech services, blah, blah. The reason for us, and, you know, maybe we're, I'm not sure, you know, maybe we're smart or maybe we're dumb for it is that I think at the end, we're building up the database one to make some money off of it two to help all these other, uh, libraries monetize their stuff better, but also too, it makes us better consultants, right? If we have access to this and strategic partnerships with all these data sources, you know, at least we believe in the long run, we can go through and develop proprietary uh, either proprietary da data sets or um, intellectual property that we can leverage more um, than just uh, leasing the well logs. I think, uh, I mean, Blockbuster and Netflix are the ones that forced us into that, into this business model. I mean, if you look at it, valuations are all uh, lo looked highly upon when you have subscription. I mean, that's one of the reasons why Blockbuster went out of the business is you were forcing people to rent and they couldn't hold on to it and they either had purchase or rent. And the subscription gives you access to all the movies or all the data. Uh, and it's more rewarding, it's on demand. Uh, so we've kind of, the oil field has kind of uh, <laughs> moved in that direction too. So I blame Netflix. <laughs> well, and I think too, is just the, the barrier to entry is so much lower. I mean, I said this last time, I think we, probably most of us started a Python short course sometime during COVID, right? I'd say most of us also didn't finish it, <laughs> myself included, right? Is that, you know, like scraping a bunch of well logs is a lot easier now than it used, than it used to be. And because of that, uh, you know, what you can get out of it, at least from a business standpoint, at least in my perspective, like it's a lot harder to justify these really high costs for something that's already out there just because we straighten the raster. I mean, for us, like, you know, and, and after this, I'll stop. But like, you know, for us, like these public logs, like for New Mexico, right? There's we scrape, there's 194,000 rasters available through the state of New Mexico, right? Um, if you want to go download 10 of them, you're not going to pay me 50 bucks for that. Like you can just go download them yourself, right? But if you want to get the whole county, you know, even a dollar a log, it might make sense, right? Um, to where you own it and you only have to buy it once. At least that's for me. It depends on, you know, if you're going after the latest and greatest plays, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you're going after like behind pot pay on, something that was drilled in 1950, all the logs that you're going to get are pretty much there, right? I mean, no one's putting triple push and triple combos to the railroad commission anymore, right? <laughs> so it's either there, it's not, or you can get a really crappy cement bond log, you know, that was flipped upside down on purpose, uh, tough a deal. So I don't know, that's just from my experience. That's super interesting. It brings up something that the current record, if he's still in the audience, he mentioned something about Databricks and I mean, and since there, that, you know, like what you're talking about leads to the ability to have massive volumes, um, then the key is to organize it. Kurt, did you want to comment? You made a comment in the chat. You may not be here or may not want to. <laughs> anyway, well, Sasha, you yeah. can speak to, yeah. Oh, Kurt, is that you? Yeah. Uh, no, it's just, again, I just wanted to, to follow up on that, uh, the conversation about ownership of, and um, subscription of the data. I think the other thing that consumers, end users and consumers of the data are finding is that as the technology continues to progress, you find more and more of these um, uh, algorithms, microservices that are available to point at that data. So you want to be able to go back and reuse that data as the as the technology progresses and gives you more ways to analyze it and, and more value to extract from it. And that's one of the advantages of, of using cloud services to store the data. You can, you know, you, you can move it between tiers of, of storage as you require it for different, uh, to support different business decisions. And I think that's, that's where people are really seeing the value of large data sets. Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually what it is now is not just how you acquire but how you look at your ultimate objective. And then looking at that in terms of building your own workflow, um, instead of just randomly exploring. <laughs> anyway, well, I just looked at the time, looks like we're out of time. And this was just wonderful. I want to um, express my appreciation every, again to, to everyone who was able to participate and also especially to our presenters and to our leadership. Gretchen had to slip away earlier I want to thank her and, and 
also Mike Bingle Davis and, and Jillian Chenin. And then also just thank you to Sashi and Brian and Jess and, and Milu and Nathan for a, a just a really fantastic and, and thought-provoking um, presentation with, with so much possibility for the future. So I want to thank you and encourage everybody to join AAPG or Renew. And also, happy Diwali tomorrow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're quite welcome. Very good. Thanks. Thanks, Susan, for the opportunity. Oh, thank you. So I'll Thanks. see you a bit later. Thank you. Thank you.